بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so blessed to be back here with you all جمع مبارك الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يادي الله فلا مدل له ومن يدلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم All praise is due to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from our bad deeds Whomsoever Allah guides, no one uh, will never be led astray And whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one who has no partner And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad is Allah's servant and messenger May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqu Allah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon O ye who believe be mindful of Allah Be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasri li amri wa ahlul uqtatim li lisani yafqahu qawli subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma alamdana innaka antal alim al hakeem and assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu uh, it's a blessing to be able to be back with you all. Uh, inshallah, today our uh, khutbah will be talking about uh, the, the topic of this is the way. So many of us may be familiar with, uh, whether directly or indirectly, with the uh, hit Star Wars TV show that's on Disney Plus of The Mandalorian. It's in three seasons now, so uh, it's kind of been an established fixture with respect to just being a part of uh, people's regular watching. Um, but whether you have, you know, had the privilege of watching the show itself, or you've kind of been at the misfortune of just getting bombarded by ads, I'm pretty sure you have seen Baby Yoda and all these other things, references to Star Wars and the Mandal Mandalorian in some way, shape or form on social media and, and so on and so forth. But uh, We'll talk a little bit about this this element that's called uh, the way, or this statement that's everywhere of this is the way, um, which is also known as the way of like the Mandalorian or the way of the Mandalore, and how it relates to the way that we as Muslims oftentimes will articulate, but maybe not think about when we when we in our prayers talk about Sirat al Mustaqim, when we talk about Allah guide us to the right path, guide us to the way, um, and how does this you know way that is in more of a fantasy universe relate to the way that we walk in our everyday lives. Um, so just a little bit of background that during Ramadan, while this show was in its third season, uh, I personally was not <laughs> at that time engaging as much or wet watching as uh, I would normally maybe outside of Ramadan, but you know, you can't get it anywhere else where you're all over social media, other ads, other things that are kind of coming. You couldn't escape this message of, hey, season three is now streaming or episode XYZ is dropped. This is the way, this is the way, this is the way. So it's like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll watch it eventually, inshallah. But you know, because it's just kind of being inundated by this that was going on. And then one of those nights in Ramadan, Ramadan. I was just kind of, you know, setting down, uh, wrapping things up. And I sat down to read um, just a little bit of the Quran before I kind of wrap things up. And one of the first verses I came across, uh, subhanAllah, how this happens probably for so many of us, like where we're just in some frame of mind, we're thinking of something, we sit down, we open the Quran, and it literally hits us with like exactly what we're thinking about or what we might be uh, kind of worried about or whatever it may be. And it meets us kind of where we are. But in this particular instance, I had a chance to just pop open the Quran and the verse I opened up to, I was reading uh, and read, uh, rabbika mustaqima, that this is the way of your Lord. This is the way. <laughs> this is the way of your Lord, the way that leads straight. And this was the translation by uh, Abdullah Yusuf Ali. And this way is commonly used throughout, but there's many other words besides the sirat or sirat al-mustaqima um, that come to mind, but that are also sometimes translated within this particular translation or other translations similar to a way of sorts. When we think about what does a way mean? Is it a literal way? Is it a metaphorical way? And in the Arabic, we know there's so many, not just within the word itself, but so many other words too, but uh, sabil as like sabilillah, the way or path of Allah. Um, you have sunnat Allah, the practice of Allah, the way of Allah. You have tariqah, another way. So there's so many different ways that, that you know pop up in thinking about what is the way or what is this way? So I just got to kind of thinking in that sense that on a consistent and regular basis, we recite Surah Fatiha during the day, during prayers, wherever it might be. Uh, we, we usually do, uh, we'll just recite it quite often, but also particularly with an emphasis on the verse of uh, the sixth verse, which says, 
uh, the same Sirat al Mustaqim that Allah has said, Wahada Sirat al Mustaqim, Wahada Sirat al Rabbika Mustaqim, that this is the way of your Lord. So, you know, we ask Allah to guide us, guide us to the right path, guide us to the straight path, to show us the way. We ask Allah, in other words, Allah, show us the way. What is your way? Where is your way? Show us the way, guide us to the way, and specifically guide us to the way of those who have earned your pleasure and not those who have gone astray, or not those who have lost their path of the way or who are not on the way. Um, but how often do we ponder upon what this way is? What, what, how often do we ponder upon what, what, what it constitutes? Um, who are those who went astray? I don't want to spend too much time talking about what this uh, way is in the, in the concept of the Star Wars universe, but it may help set the framework with respect to how we conceptualize the Sirat al-Mustaqim, when we think about it with relation to it manifesting in a you know sci-fi uh, kind of manifestation there. But what is the way? So when we talk about this topic of this is the way, in the show, in the Star Wars universe, uh, in the Mandalorian itself, the way is understood to be an ancient religion. It's an ancient creed that's uh, very strongly held. It incorporates a strong ethical and code, uh, moral code of behavior. It also incorporates a strong uh, sense of a shared collective sense of responsibility uh, and identity and community, but it's one that must be strictly adhered to. And particularly one particular way of manifesting this observation of the way or following the way is by wearing a helmet, is by wearing the uh, you know, kind of signature Mandalorian helmet uh, that looks kind of like a Spartan helmet. It's just you know, there, you can't see the face of the person, but the removal of which of this helmet if done in the presence of other living beings or other people, would constitute apostasy, would constitute that you've left the way, that you've given up your path on the way, and that you've uh, forfeited your allegiance to that. And so if somebody was to take off their helmet, they would essentially be kicked out of the order. They'd be kicked out of the way, and they'd have to take, undertake a very actually grueling and sometimes think about impossible way of being able to purify themselves to get back into the way. So for Mandalorians, for, for these people from this planet of Mandalore, the helmet is not just an accessory. You know, it's not just to wear it, just to always be protected from uh, battle or whatnot, but it's also a symbol. It represents so much more than just the literal aspect. It represents uh, all these other things of the way, this, this thing that they're, they're on, this, this path, this religion, this creed that they have accepted and that they're following. But the story, of course, with the Mandalorian, it becomes more and more complex and more nuanced, as we'll later encounter in the story, other devoted Mandalorians who don't exactly follow the way by removing their helmets. And that's a story for another time. But we want to keep it simple, inshallah, for our sake and simple to our space here. Now, as I've mentioned, it might feel like apples and oranges. What does Star Wars have to do with Islam? And was, uh, you know the way of the Mandalore have to do with Sirat al-Mustafim? But it might be prudent for us, nevertheless, to ponder not only on what this way is, when we think about our way, when we think about the Sirat al when we think about the way of Islam, the way that Allah has ordained upon us. But how does one walk this way? How does, uh, what does it entail? What does this way entail for us? What is our helmet? What is the, the, the thing that we put on that we must keep on at all times um, that is maybe a symbol or whatever it may be that represents that we are accepting and on the way. And it's something that if we take off or if we lose, we also similarly fall to the wayside of the way and we, we, we cease to be on that path. So as we learn from the Mandalorian, as we mentioned, it becomes more nuanced. But what we're going to be talking about, inshallah, is going beyond the Sirat al-Mustaqim of Surah Fatima, beyond this simply encountering this way in which we come to Allah and we say, guide us to the right path, guide us to the right way, and we, we look at a few other passages in the Quran, a few other times that this way in general is mentioned, uh, giving us a deeper context with respect to not only understanding what the way is, but also what it requires of us, what it entails, what does it go through. And before we do that, it might be helpful for us to also share a short snippet of a story from the Quran that is very well known, but allows us to take a look at the converse side of the way that if we're asking Allah to guide us to the right path, guide us to the path and the way upon those who have been bestowed your favor, it gives us the converse of those who uh, have been led astray or those who have fallen off the path and gone a separate way or gone differently. 
So the story itself is within Surah Al-A'raf in chapter seven of the Quran and very well known, as I mentioned, it's kind of the creation story with respect to uh, the Islamic narrative, but it's occurring in the heavenly space and then it occurs in the earthly uh, space as well. But uh, it's a dialogue that is happening when uh, Allah is, uh, has created humanity and in, cre in creation of Adam, this human, uh, Allah tells the angels, submit. He says, submit and prostrate yourselves before Adam. And the narration or the, the Quran uh, verse goes that so they all submitted except Iblis. He didn't join those who submitted. Uh, and Allah said, what, is, what has prevented you from prostrating when I ordered you to do so? And Iblis says, I am better than him. You created me from fire. You created him from clay. I'm not going to submit to him. And Allah then responds and get down from here. You know, get away from here. It's not for you to show arrogance in this space. It's, arrogance is not permitted here, so get out. You know, you're one of those degraded, debased, humiliated people. Get get out of here. And so then, uh, interestingly, this dialogue then happens between Allah and Iblis, where Iblis responds, says, then give me respite, give me respite until a day when all of them will be resurrected. And Allah said that you will be given resurrect, you'll be given this respite. And then Iblis responds back, because you have thrown me out of the way, because you've kicked me out of the way, I will lie in wait of them. I will be ready at the side, I will be ready to ambush them on your straight way, on your sirat al mustaqim. I will come to them, I will ambush them, assault them from the front, from the back, from their right to their left. I will uh, come all over and you will find most of them won't be grateful or remembering of you. And Allah responds back that, you know, get out of here, condemned, rejected, indeed, uh, that whosoever follows you and, and falls trapped to that, um, verily, they will also encounter the same end that you will within the context of the hellfire, that get out, you know, you, this is, whoever does that will be there. Um, and we see how in the, sen in the sense here, when we, when we take a step back, um, because the story then pivots from this heavenly space to then the interaction that happens between Adam and Hawa and uh, Iblis or say Shaitan, when uh, Allah has ordained for them, do not approach this tree, do not you know, live as you will in this garden, don't eat of the forbidden fruit. And Shaitan comes to them first kind of bartering and says, hey, you know, uh, that tree over there, that's actually not too bad. Like, you know, your Lord just wanted to, is holding you back. You know, he, he was holding you back, said you're going to become a mortal or angel. So there's nothing, there's not no harm for you in that. Just go and take it, get, get, get what's yours. Um, and, and tells them, I'm your sincere advisor. I'm truly your sincere advisor. I'm your helper. Um, and Allah says that he casts both of them down because of their, because of this deception. Uh, he casts both of them down through this deception. But he he was on. He was. You would just think about this imagery that where 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 were Hawa and where were Adam walking? Were they on this sirat al mustaqim? They were on the path of Allah. They were kind of given the space, and he's just lying right at the way. So he's he's literally right over there. Um, and and so what's very interesting is that Iblis was kicked out of the way. He was removed from the way. He did not submit. Um, he, he saw himself as superior to Adam. He had this arrogance. He disobeyed Allah directly. Um, all these different things resulted in him getting kicked out of the way. So think about whatever his helmet was. He, he took his helmet off. He, he disobeyed defiantly Allah, but also he did other things that started to uh, add on to this aspect of what does it mean to be kicked out of the way? And not just was he kicked out of the way, but very interestingly, he still has access to the way um, and, and not in the same way that he did before, but in a way that hinders other people, in a way that he becomes a misguider for other people. Um, so he was kicked out of the way, but he's still able to access the Sirat al Mustaqim from the sidelines, from you know just the throwing uh, the different shade or the hate or whatever it is, just misleading people, whispering or whatever it may be. But he's still on that on that path that we ask ourselves, we ask Allah to guide us to, guide us to the right path, keep us on the straight way. But we sometimes lose sight of the fact that this is a, a way that is going to be a bit of a struggle. So when we think about this, going back from now, the story of Shaitan and, and you know the, uh, the conceptualization of the way when it was it means to be thrown out of it, going into the way of when we think about Sirat al-Mustaqim. When we think about the Sirat al-Mustaqim, the way from this, how we see it is, is, is not one that is the way of arrogance. So the first thing that we look at when we break this down of the story of what Shaitan did that I'm not going to prostrate to him. I'm better than him. So he disobeyed Allah first and foremost. Um, secondly, he manifested arrogance. And Allah responded that 
get out from here. It's not permissible for you to show arrogance here. This is this is not that space. So uh, showing that arrogance. Um, so it was not the way of Allah to not just only be defiantly disobedient, but also to have this kind of element of racism, this element of prejudice that was inherent there. But it's also an interesting to think about when we look at Sirasul Mustaqim as the way. It's not a path that is, uh, you know, like the yellow brick road uh, of Emerald City. It's not interrupted by anything, um, but it is one that is uh, not unhindered by Shaitan. So when we ask Allah to guide us, imagine us not just maybe running a marathon, doing something that is requiring our full exertion, but on the sidelines, we are uh, continually being jeered by somebody saying like, oh, you, you can't do it. Or, hey, just give up now. Or like, hey, you know, you run enough. Just stop running now. Just to just, just take a little break. You deserve it or whatnot. T taking you away from the, the end goal that's in mind. Um, and so we're continuing to run this marathon, doing whatever it is, asking Allah for help. But mindful of the fact that there's somebody or there's some entity there that's uh, some forces that are there that are wishing that we don't do the make it to our goal, that we don't succeed. Uh, but apart from this aspect, so we've kind of laid out this, what keeps us on that way? What helps us to stay in that way? What does this way kind of constitute uh, in a sense? What does it mean? So when we, as I mentioned, we look at and lift up a few passages uh, from the Quran that help us to then conceptualize this. So we can always, all, already kind of get a image in our mind of whether a literal way, whether a metaphorical way of a path of a whatever direction or way that you're kind of going but one that uh, is definitely is, is uh, marked by this adversity, is marked by a, a bit of an uphill kind of a climb because you have already an adversary that is rooting for you to get you off the path, to take the low-hanging fruit, to do that which is getting you off as that one had been kicked out as well. So to do that which was not mindful of Allah. So we dive into a few passages that were mentioned and uh, we'll lift up uh, where, where they are in the Quran, but first and foremost in Surah An-Nisa, uh, Allah lifts up that those who Allah has thrown out of the way, apart from Iblis, but those who have uh, Allah has already kind of cast out of the way, who have been you know, disbarred from the way of Allah, um, are those who call others to disbelief. They call others to reject faith, but they're also those who Allah specifically mentions as the hypocrites. We know these in the Islamic history as not just people who are, you know, two two faced per se, but especially within the context of the Prophet Muhammad's time, these were people who um, were known as the Munafiqun, whom the Quran lifts up, that they try to deceive Allah. That when they stand up to pray, they stand up without sincerity, but they stand up for the sake of wanting to be seen. They stand up for the sake uh, of, of personal gain. They hardly remember Allah at all. And they are distracted in their mind uh, and not even considering about Allah, but they're showing up to the mosques. They are lining rank and file with the other Muslims, but they're just, they're not doing it for the sincere purpose. Uh, and uh, Allah, very interesting, he says in the Quran that, you know, never for you, Prophet Asa, never will you find for them the way. You know, they, they're kind of already off the beaten path. They're somewhere else. But that this constitutes, in a sense, those who are thrown off of the way, who are already on the sidelines, those who call others to disbelief, those who are living in hypocrisy, those who don't remember Allah, those who are acting insincerely, and those who inherently hinder others from the path. They reject faith outright. Again, in Surah Maida, Allah also lifts up that uh, be not excessive in your religion unjustly. Don't follow the desires of a people who have already gone astray. So taking idols of these worldly things, of, of people, of putting up figures of belief or figures of reference or figures of devotion besides Allah, especially within the creation. Surah Al-Anam lifts up that those who deny our signs willfully um, are lost in darkness, that, uh, they, that uh, Allah leaves whoever he wants uh, to go astray, but guides whoever that he wills to the straight way. And very interestingly, later in Surah An-Anam, Allah lifts up that the prophets, peace and blessings be upon all of them, they were all guided to the right way, and that this is the guidance of Allah. This is the, this is the way of Allah. But very interestingly, at the end of that same verse, it says that if they were to join other gods with Allah, all that they would have done would have been in vain. So thinking about that they were on this right path, they're on the way, but the one thing that would have gotten them way off of that, to, to put them all together off that way, taking up gods besides Allah, taking faith in something beside Allah. And then it continues on in the sense that if we uh, obey the majority of those who are on earth, if we put our faith in the majority of the folks who are here on earth, 
they will make us lose that way of Allah. Um, so thinking about where do we put our faith? Where do we put our devotion? Um, and in, in, in closing of this of Surah An'am, it's also lifted up that uh, there comes to a sign to the people, the people who disbelieve, but they say that we won't believe until we receive a sign, just like those received from the uh, by the messengers. Um, and Allah responds that you know Allah knows best where and how to carry out the mission. It's not up to you, but soon those who say such a thing will be overtaken by humiliation and be overtaken before Allah. And this is the way of Allah. This is the way of your Lord, leading strip the verse that we had opened up with. Uh, so we see in this aspect that putting Allah to the test is also a way of getting yourself out of the way. But the way is also a, 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 a bit like a furnace to uh, an unpure or unkind of uh, formed metal that when uh, iron in its raw form is put in a furnace, it purifies, it, it becomes a, you know, the, the, the perfect kind of element that is gold, silver, all these precious metals, they achieve those beautiful forms at the end once they've been purified. And so this way is not just one that we go on cruise control on, but it's one that requires us to uh, become cleansed in a way, to become better uh, holistically. And so in this, in this space as well, you see with respect to, uh, as Allah has placed with respect to this way, it's one that uh, shed, makes us shed those things that uh, hinder us from Allah. And so uh, lastly, in a few things, uh, as Allah lifts up in uh, the same in Surah An'am and then a little bit of Surah Al-Araf uh, with respect to what does it look like to stay on the way? So in Surah uh, Al-An'am, -Al Allah lifts up that come, or it says to the Prophet say, uh, O Prophet, come. Your Lord has prohibited you. Tell the people what your Lord has prohibited. Your Lord has prohibited you from uh, associating anything with Allah in terms of partners, associating, taking up any gods besides Allah, has uh, prohibited you to not be good to your parents, so be good to your parents, um, to not kill your children out of poverty or any fear of poverty, um, to not go near shameful acts, whether open or secret, to not kill a person whom Allah has uh, given inherent sacred worth, except in matters of justice um, or in, in those elements there, to not approach the property of the orphan or those who are marginalized, to give full measure and full weight in fairness, to be just when you speak, and to fulfill the covenant of Allah. And at the conclusion of this verse, which is verse 153, Allah says, verily, this is my way leading straight. This is my way leading straight. Follow it and do not follow these other ways lest you should deviate and the purpose so that you may become God conscious. And we, we see in this element that how do we stay on the way? How do we stay uh, in this space as this verse lifts out? It's not an exhaustive list because there's so much more in the Quran that we can uh, kind of talk about, but for the sake of time with respect to this verse, staying on the way entails not associating partners with Allah, being good to one's family and one's parents and one's kin, showing that dutifulness, not killing one's children or your, your children or your dependents out of poverty, not killing a person unjustly, not taking the property or seizing the property or hoarding the property of an orphan or someone on the margins, being someone who is fair and, and just, being someone who's just, not just in their action, but also their speech, and being someone was connected, not just with their faith and their worship, but also being uh, connected to the intentionality of God consciousness, of Allah. Why are we doing this? We see that Allah lifted up the hypocrites were showing up for namaz too. They're showing up for prayer too. But why were they showing up? Why are we showing up for our rituals and thinking about these things? And the last verse we'll share is uh, in, uh, in Surah Al-An'am, uh, uh, verse 161, that Allah lifts up, whoever comes to me with a good deed uh, will receive 10 times as much. Whoever comes to me with the evil deed will receive uh, no more than the like of it, and they won't be wrong. Say, O Prophet, verily, my Lord has guided me to the way that is straight, the way that is right, a religion that was a way that Abraham had trod prior, and who was truth and he was true in his faith, and he joined not other gods with Allah, and say to them that my prayer, my offering, my life, my sacrifice, and my death are all for Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. For he is uh, alone, no partner, and I've, this is what I've been commanded, and I am the one uh, who submits to this. So thinking about the purpose of this path is God consciousness, 
And what sustains on this path, as we see, is this devotion. And when we look back and in, in closing and summary, that the purpose of this path being God consciousness, the element at the initial point that had gotten at least kicked out of the path was kicking, was, was rejecting this, was to uh, give this aspect of not being devoted to Allah, to not dedicate this, to not submit to Allah. This submission was the first blow. The second was the arrogance. The third was continuing to hinder in a sense. So you see how it builds up. But how do we stay on the path now? going back from the ethereal plane to the earthly plane, wherever we may be here, how do we stay on this path? First and foremost, we don't associate partners with Allah. We don't be arrogant. We don't be prejudiced towards others. We stay our best, try our best to stay faithful, dutiful to our loved ones, to our parents, to our spouses. We approach not, not, not even uh, you know, participating and don't even go near things that are lewd or shameful, being just, being fair, speaking that which is truth and not hindering or debilitating other people that are trying to get their life right, that are trying to come on the path. Um, being on the way is a consistent struggle. These are things we talk about. Shaitan is lying, said, I'll lie at the weight of your Siddhaf al Mustaqim. I will be there walking step and step on the sidelines. Um, it's a consistent struggle. So we have to continue to check in on ourselves and how often, what causes us to maybe go off of the straight path. You know, Shaitan says that he's lying in wait. Allah tells us in the Quran that Shaitan's handicrafts are these things, um, gambling, alcohol, intoxicants, these things, these are these are Satan's handicrafts. These aren't just, you know, uh, things that are just there, but they are designed for you to be taken off the path. They're distractions. And what's this taking off the path? What is this thing that will get you off the path? What is this element? It's that aspect of God consciousness. So when we think about what is our hel helmet, uh, we said the Mandalorians hold on to their helmet. What is our helmet? Um, what is the one thing that if we shed or if we lose, we go off the way completely? Recognition that there is no God but Allah or recognition that we forget Allah, that we don't remember Allah. Uh, uh, Omar radiallahu anh had shared that if we lose uh, everything in the world, if we don't, if we lose our salah, we lose everything. Um, if we'd had everything else lost, but we hold on to our salah, we still have something so much more than anything else can buy. So keep that spiritual helmet on. But don't just affix it to one particular practice or one thing and think we're self-sufficient, just like the hypocrites. What does that helmet mean? What is, how does it connect to Allah? How is it a reminder of Allah? And how can we put on that ritual of helmet, the helmet of ritual, but still be people that perpetuate harm and take people off the path, uh, just like those who were uh, living in hypocrisy. So let us, inshallah, do what we can to keep our spiritual helmets on and to walk the way, to do uh, the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi to walk in the way of Allah, to stay on that way uh, as our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had taught, as Allah had instructed, uh, and as they continue to remind us that this is the way, inshallah. So may Allah guide us, guide us all to the right way, the straight way, and the path of those whom Allah has bestowed favor and not of those who have gone off the way. Allahumma ameen. Rabbana taqabal minna. Inna ka antus samir alim. Jazak la khair again for uh, your time and for your space. May Allah allow us to leave this Jummah better than we had come into it and to leave every place better than we had come into it, inshallah. Um, we just have a few announcements here to close us out and uh, just to uh, lift up what we have coming up, inshallah. So first and foremost, we have uh, a... Uh, Right. Well, we have a book, uh, monthly book club meeting, uh, inshallah, today at eight o'clock. We're going to be uh, discussing the book Muslim Girl, A Coming of Age uh, by Amani uh, Al Khattab. Uh, Khattab. <laughs> Sorry, I might butcher that completely, but we'll have a, uh, we'll be having the book club there, inshallah. There's more details on our website, um, and you can kind of learn a little bit more about uh, this. Um, everybody's welcome, even if you haven't read the book or whatnot, you just want to be a part of the discussion, uh, you can check out our website, musclespace.org, for that. We also have our youth Islamic studies, uh, inshallah, to, uh, uh, happening on Sunday, uh, so Sunday, April 30th, but this Sunday at 10 o'clock, I will be talking about our ibadah. Salah and Zakah, the second and third pillar of Islam. And this is for grade school students focusing on various Islamic topics uh, for age about six to 18. But if you have any questions, reach out to us. Again, all of this is on the Muslim Space website. So uh, definitely do check that out. And the last thing we have next next week, inshallah, we're continuing our Inside Islam Intrafaith series. So we're going to be uh, discussing Lahore Ahmadi Islam. We'll have our guest, uh, Dr. Aisha Khan, uh, on Wednesday, May 3rd, next Wednesday at 7 o'clock. It'll be live on Zoom and on Facebook, and you can register at muslimspace.org, but this is a series that allows us to 
give voice and hear perspectives from uh, those who are on the margins of the Muslim community and whose uh, communities oftentimes don't have a chance to be given a proper air time. And the last thing that we have is next week, a uh, Quran halakha, our monthly Quran halakha for May will come up. It'll be Surah al Ayla, um, and it'll be at 11 o'clock on Sunday. Uh, inshallah, again, all of these things, it, uh, all of these things are going to be on uh, on on our website. So please do check in there if you have any questions. But we appreciate you being here, and I pray that you have a blessed rest of your Jum'ah, inshallah.